So as we said, we are going to engage in a captivating conversation to explore the mentorship. But more than that, we're talking about youth mentors. What do we mean by that? I'll tell you a little bit later on what reverse mentorship um, is, because we did have to unpack a lot of that, trying to find the right word for it. Um, but I will let them present themselves, because there's no better way than giving the parole aux jeunes, so give them their voice. Isaiah, let's start with you. Hi, everyone. I'm Isaiah, the guy who asked the questions. Um, I'm currently working as a new grad in CGI and pursuing my MBA in investment management at Concordia. And I have a background with an undergrad in finance at, from Concordia and just a big portfolio of student leadership and community development. Hi, everyone. My name is Candice. Um, my pronouns are she, her. And um, I'm currently a student in CJEP. I'm graduating this semester. Um, I mean, aside from school, I'm a pilot. I'm also um, the executive of my student union. And most importantly, I am the ambassador for Technovation Girls. So um, yeah, I try to um, empower girls to pursue careers in STEM and to make them learn uh, more things that about like their potential. So yeah. Hey everyone, my name is Simon. No, we're good. All right, uh, hello, everyone. hello everyone, my name is Simon. I am a final year software engineering student currently studying at McGill University. Outside of school, I also founded a software development company. We do software development consultancy and currently building a new company uh, for real estate development. Um, other than that, you know, did a couple of internships here and there between startups, big tech. So really excited to be joined by the fellow panelists today. And uh, yeah. Hello, people. Hello, people uh, online. Uh, my name is Clement. I'm from the Laval University in Quebec. Uh, a little bit of background of me. Um, I'm in software engineering student and um, I work uh, a lot in aerospace group for Laval University, two years launching rockets uh, all around the world. And I'm also involved in the student life by organizing, organizing several meetings like the cocktail tea that we used to have once a year by regrouping 60 to 70 uh, companies for people, for our members that will have an internship uh, during the summer. And I've, uh, I'm also a freelancer in mobile app that I developed for the Laval University. And to finish on that, I have done three internships, two in the medical field and one in the security field. Thank you, panelists. So as you can hear from their experience, they haven't done much. Um, I, I'll present myself just for a brief, since they've done an introduction, I won't go into the curriculum or my journey, but I'm a partnership manager. I work with a lot of uh, students in my role, so uh, for FDM Group, uh, powering people behind tech and powering uh, youth, but also we discussed earlier in another conversation today about people that need to upskill or reskill themselves, so we do work in that space as well, and anything that has to do about learning, very interested in. So without further ado, let's dive into the definition, and you'll allow me to read, I hope, the reverse mentorship. What does it mean, really? So reverse mentorship, as we discussed, is a practice where a junior employee teaches or guides a senior colleague. This means that it could be in areas like today, in tech, uh, but it can be also about diversity, generational perspective as well. It can help both parties to learn new skills, uh, foster mutual understanding, promote a more inclusive culture. Reverse mentorship, as we defined it, is also di taking different forms. This means that it could be one-on-one -on -one sessions, it could be group events, it could be participating in panels, it could be reciprocal exchanges. We have some examples, but they'll share that further in the conversation. We want to start by actually focusing on some of the challenges of understanding the reverse mentorship and why it's complicated as a concept because we tend to forget about it. So the traditional view, we know it's, it's senior, junior. How about thinking that we can challenge that idea? How would you, 
how would you suggest to challenge it? So I'll start and similar to any form of discrimination where it's like this falls under kind of like that ageism where you hear that generational thing where, you know, the youth are lazy, they don't like to work or those stigmas associated to that. And it starts by just treating people as if, well, they're people and that their experiences are valid and you want to hear them per se. So like, because when you think, if you look at somebody and you're like, oh, they're too young, you don't know what they've experienced. I often tell my friends that age doesn't reflect maturity. It's really like experience and growth. So you could see somebody like Simon, per se, who's an entrepreneur at such a young age and somebody who's lived twice as long and be unemployed and not wanting to work, for example. So it's just really about not judging people and giving, allowing them the opportunity to express what they can bring to the table and looking to them for that solution. And in youth, it's like just yeah, asking them and, and for their opinions because these decisions affect them. I think that one important thing to note is that um, youth were not a threat to the older generations, to the seniors, um, because I think that like in terms of like digital literacy or like in terms of um, openness and and also like about all the other insights that we can bring. Um, I think that what we can bring to the table is actually very valuable for the seniors to learn and to develop their strategies and to adapt to the, you know, the diverse changes during the market, in the market, um, because we are kind of the future. And um, some, some of us, we had like experiences that are more, um, that are more like reflecting the current realities of the world um, today. So when we partner like the seniors and the juniors, and we don't see it as senior and junior, we see it more as more like a collaboration team. I think that's when the organizations can, can achieve um, better decisions to adapt to all the changes in the, in the world. So yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I totally agree with that. I think one of the biggest challenges we face going into work or working with other people is we might want to put ourselves in boxes. Uh, just because, you know, when I worked for my first client, they were much older than me and the rest of my team. But um, we, we kind of went in and we were expecting to learn a lot from them. And kind of through there, we kind of fell into a trap, right? Uh, but thankfully, we had a great experience also through reverse mentorship. And we look at age as a certain thing that can like pull you back if you're too young. Uh, as Candace said, like you have, uh, through different walks of life, you have different experiences, but also you also could have different types of energy. So when you're younger, I feel, but this is also true to uh, some older, uh, a lot of the older folks out there too. But when you're younger, you have that energy, you have that drive to want to build something together. And I think it's a great dynamic to have this balance between young younger, older, and just work together and form a, a, a nicer passage between the, the two. Yeah, um, also we have to include diversity. It's like, you know, doing a, a road trip or something like this. You know, people from around the world know things that we don't know. For example, marketing in Europe is very different from our marketing. And I think if you can include more people, young people from different horizons that could and will help the company to have a better representation. Um, also, it's important to take uh, the experience of young people. Uh, even though the, their projects are really small, they can be very thoughtful for older people and keep in mind that a good team is a team with older people very experienced and young people with new ideas. Thank you. So to talk about mentorship being, um, as most people interpret it, this person that guides and that shares their experience and their knowledge, you as mentees, because you all were at some point in your journey, it leads me to ask you, what would you feel was hindering the potential of reversing that relationship? So in your ability to fully leverage uh, bettering the perspective on a problem or facilitating decision making that you would feel would be more inclusive and diverse? 
So a lot of that experience came from when I was a student leader. And when you're a student leader, you're kind of like representing the voice of many. And so it's like there's always like you'll say university administration will be want to be safe. If you told them like in 2019 that I wanted to go to class online because it's more convenient, it's safer, there's germs in the air, they would have laughed you out of the room until COVID came and then they did just that. So a lot of like, um, and this comes from more that senior or that I think I know better. It's like when you don't give people the opportunity to kind of like truly express themselves, then it's hard to kind of like push that envelope because you're putting them in that box of like, well, we know better, we decide better. So we're not gonna like, we'll hear you, but we won't like adapt to you versus now in my career, I find that I, I myself as like, I'm somebody who has now two years work experience at CGI. I'm onboarding people who may have had like 20 years of experience. And so when they first like um, are recruited to the company, you're, they rely on you and they ask you these questions. So it's like a perfect example of like, well, just because I I've, I've only have two years work experience doesn't mean that I can't help you and support you in your everyday function or like um, help remove a certain obstacle or find something. So it's really about going and having those discussions and like a mutual respect type of thing and perspective and balancing the constraints in, in between. I totally agree with that. Um, being involved in um, student governance, there's a lot of situations where um, it's more like the school, um, like deciding on things um, for students, but the students were not necessarily like um, consulted. And even if they're consulted, they don't have the, um, the decision making power. Um, they're only consulted. And in these situations, I think that what is like hindering like the development of like feasible solutions is that um, some problems like you know back in like the 2000s were like back in back in the days is not like appearing the same way as now. Um, I can think of like maybe like um, like just the diversity like equity and inclusion in general right now because um, you know back in the days like we don't discuss it as often but today. It, in theory, we value diversity, equity, and inclusion, but um, in reality, in reality, it might be like more hidden in our workplaces, in our schools, and who are experiencing that is more the youth who now know the importance of you know um, having different perspective and the importance for decision makers to listen to us. Um, so I would say definitely um, it is kind of hindering our abilities to um, find adapted solutions or like, you know, like, or like solutions that are more like, you know, going like innovative and adapted to um, all the current like changes that has happened. And also hindering like how we can actually adopt these principles in practice. Yeah, um, I completely agree with my fellow panelists you know, over here. Couldn't have put that way uh, better. I just want to hone in on uh, COVID and how it still, I think, hinders some of the possibilities we have today. I remember when I was interning at all these other companies that I was working at, it was really just a one-way uh, just scenario, just like pushing information onto me, telling me what to do. And I still feel like a lot in a lot of uh, ways we're still recovering from um that vision and that way of thinking, which is great, uh, which is which creates a lot of room, I think, for an opportunity of the changing uh, the way how we see this. And I, I think uh, Tech Nation is doing a great job with Future Wave to, to see this. Um, so yeah, I um, completely agree with what uh, these two fellow panelists said. Yeah, and, uh, I'll leave it to Clément to finish. <laughs> yeah, I also completely agree. I don't know what I can add on this, but I can. We'll reverse the panel, we'll yes. reverse the order. So with the next question. <laughs> reverse mentorship? Yeah. <laughs> um, so to continue on this learning journey of on-programming, deprogramming, should I say, our perception, our collective understanding of mentorship, I would like to dig deeper into the power dynamics because we just touched upon that. It means like flipping the whole concept on its head and adopting reverse mentorship. 
we have to add the adjective to not forget, but technically it's just simply mentorship, but done differently. The idea is, would you be able, when we're disrupting traditional hierarchies that way, there's a way to, we're stepping on toes somewhat in some way, would you have an idea of how to break down the silos? Not an example necessarily, or how would you make it more seamless, adopting that view? I give it to you, Clément. Yeah. Um, we have to let young people do things uh, sometimes. Uh, it's hard to understand for older people that we have new ideas. And it happens to me that I have an idea, but I'm really into it. And you have to hit a wall sometimes to, you know, understand what it's like. So don't hesitate to let the young speak. Don't hesitate to, you know, I'm, I'm quite lost, sorry for that. Um, to, to, to help you on that, you did talk when we were together about humility and the, the need to take a step back. But how do you invite, let's talk about like, how do we invite somebody to do that in a gentle manner or? To give responsibilities. Mm. Uh, you have to give responsibility to young people because maybe he's doing an internship right now and maybe in five years he will be at the opposite job that he will be, for example, uh, the chief of the division and he will start uh, giving lessons, giving, being a mentor to this person. So you have to treat people like you wanted to be treated and I think that's the really important facts uh, now to let young uh, people being themselves in the in the industry. I think a, an example where I, you know, this question of credibility or breaking down walls came up to me is when I was hiring for senior developers on some of the projects I was working on. And, you know, it feels like a lot of these uh, interviews that I ran a question that came to me often is, how old are you? And like, why are you, uh, like, wow, it's so impressive that you're working on this at such a young age. Um, and really the basis of this is, you know, from one side, it feels like me, uh, I need to build credibility. Uh, but I think in a mentorship scenario, you need to break down these walls and you want to have an equal footing between the two people who are who are working on this thing. And at the end of the day, the, the, the main vision that comes across, I think, for at least in my scenario, is we want this project to succeed. We are doing this for this project and we will do the best both by developing ourselves, developing our own team. And at the end of the day, what we get out of this is something that's well executed, a driven team, and something ultimately that's fulfilling for everyone. And I think that can be done in great ways if uh, mentorship is applied correctly. Very insightful. Um, so I think like one of the ways to make reverse mentorship more like seamless, it's also like add, um, add different opportunities for um, young people to like take responsibility of, because you know, Right now, I think like we're more focused on like, oh, young people have digital literacy. Young people have like, um, you know, this openness about the world. Like they have more like expertise in like diversity and things like that. But I think that like we should not limit to that. Um, you know, as youth, we also have some other skills, like for example, like decision making, identifying problems. Um, providing solutions and these are the resp responsibilities that are like usually traditionally more um, accorded to senior teams and I think that um, the young the young workers should also be part of that conversations and they they can also they can also have you know the confidence and they, they also have the potential to take on these opportunities already and at the same time like I feel like right now it's a lot of like um, there's the juniors team, 
um, doing things and then reporting back to the seniors team. Uh, but then why not make it like more like a junior slash seniors team where like the two different um, level of like workers like work together into um, in problem solving into like, you know, different um, plans, strategies. I think that could really help make it more like make the transition like more smooth and having like this like reverse mentorship taking place. I completely agree, Candice. In terms of feeding off of that, I find that when, similar to like the diversity checkbox, it's like there's typically like that kind of like age checkbox where like we want to recruit young so that like we can have them for the next 20 years or like just have them there and like slowly wait for something to come. But when you actively include the voices, not just because they're young, but you're hiring them with the, with the idea of, I want like we want them to be a part of us so treat them as if they are a part of you something my boss currently does that i that i like and like it um challenges me to grow is like he'll give me a task that'd be like okay he'll just explain broad broad points it's like we need to do this event and then i'm like okay and then he'll let me come up with the idea let me come up with all the details everything that needs to go for it and then provide feedback and like if if he has a question or be like what not like it's coming from me so now i own this project i own this initiative and this idea and either you like it or you don't and you see like now it's like he's seeing it from a different way because it would probably be completely different from what um he would have came up and something one of my teachers often says is that history doesn't repeat itself it rhymes so it's like companies can get in that oh well if it ain't broke don't fix it it's like we've done this for years so why change it but like that um that mentality is like stagnant like you're just remaining constant you always want to be getting bigger better efficient and so that growth mindset really can help and by recruiting and including those voices because sometimes it's like when you're a co-op because like as someone coming from the co-op it's like they're like they're here for four four months i can't trust them with anything if they break it we got to fix it and they're just a tax credit but you really now have like a free trial of seeing growth and innovation from a new way and if you like it this could be your next new grad this could be your next director you never know so treat treat them as that and watch them grow and it's okay to fail and adapt because that's kind of like the gateway to the future. We love failure. <laughs> we can build on that, absolutely. And I feel like um, this is what we can learn from tech as well, um, as it really kind of seeps into other departments within organization because it's not everybody who's a dev uh, in any kind of tech company. And it brings us to realizing the big picture. It's if we want to kind of break down that power dynamic, we want to go way back. We want to try to see it from afar as if we take a step away from the earth and observe it and understand realities from afar. So thinking about our understanding now, our, our exploration journey of that concept, we have touched upon a certain stereotypes and assumptions that we're making with youth in general, or just people that are newer to a team, because that could be also the young aspect or junior aspect that we touched upon. We want also this to be for organization that they need to understand experiential learning and not have it done to be a recruiting gimmick. How would you suggest authenticity if somebody would come up and approach you for such a relationship, such a project, you described the task just now, and I'm gonna disrupt the order again. I'm gonna go to you, Candice. Oh, me? Yes. Okay. Um, in the middle. Okay. Um, I think like, um, actually like one important thing is to um, go away from tokenism, um, because if we wanted to be authentic, you cannot like, be like, oh, like I want this young person to work in that because you know I have this perception of like young people would come and bring these insights. Like I think like it's really important for um, you know for the people like who are more like 
um, established already to not expect a certain um, a certain skills like coming from youth or not ex not to expe expect like a certain things that youth will bring to the table. Um, because yes, we do like we can bring um, certain things more like you know towards the digi the digital side and more towards like everything that is more close to use, but that at the same time, we have seen how the older generation is making decisions and we have seen how it is actually impacting us as well. So, you know, sometimes we have other insights that are more um, towards like reacting to, um, or like more like, it's more like reflections um, that we had after that we saw the older generation making decisions. And I think that these should also be valued in that reverse mentorship. Um, yeah, to create authenticity. And also at the same time, like for experiential learning, um, you know, in theory, we're like, we're trying to promote like equality. In theory, we're trying to be inclusive, diverse, but in practice, it's, it's, not, a, it's not always that. And like, you know, who are actually like on the field and like experiencing that is really like, you know, the new interns, like the, the young people, and like, um, I mean, maybe some like um, people from the older generation also experience that, but then um, young people also have like the new insights of like how to tackle these problems because now we really talk about it more often. And yeah, so should I pick who to go next? Yes. Um, I think I'll. <laughs> Easy target. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, the, the idea of breaking down the stereotypes, something that needs to be done all the time, I think it's re really having hard conversations. Taking time aside, not to talk about work, not to talk about anything else, just you know, one-on-one, -on -one, truthful conversation, one that you would have with your friends, with your close ones, but really in this, uh, in this scenario, uh, whoever you're working with, and I think uh, that's at least step number one to 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 go through these things. I um, in tech companies a lot of time you have sprint retrospectives at the end of every two weeks. You kind of uh, talk about what went well this week, what didn't, what could be improved, action items based on that. But also special thanks. You know, um, at the end of the day, you remind yourselves you're all human. You're all learning. So really hone in on these conversations that I think can become very fruitful for. Any organization? Yeah, it's going to be brief for me. Uh, to create authenticity is the fact that, again, responsibility for young people. I know it's the same topics for me since <laughs> the beginning of the, of the of the talk. But you know, if you want to create authenticity, you need to be real with people. Sometimes you have to say it's good. What you've done is very good. But sometimes we fail, and it's not a shame to fail. Like I said, I hit several walls, and it's I'm here again. I'm here, so you know it's all be fine. Just treat people like they wanted you to be treated. Uh, you have to. Um, sorry, you need to. Um, it's a question of respect, right? What? It's a question of respect. Yes, of course. It's, it's all about respect. How about you, Isaiah? Sorry, not the mic. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and I agree with all my fellow panelists, but in terms of genuinity, it takes some vulnerability. You have to like throw in either, if you're a senior, you got to be transparent or um, I don't like senior. If you're well seasoned, you've been around the block and like you've failed and you got to be transparent. And like often we have human beings, we forget the hard times when we start to, when it starts to work out. We forget about the hundred co op applications once you're done co op because you're just like, well, I have my work experience. I got it. But like if you're, um, if you're a mentor, you have to be vulnerable with your mentee. And then also that same vulnerability is required if you need help or if you want something don't be shy to be like oh well you know i don't understand this ai thing or what what the big hoopla is ask your mentee who is a software engineer or like um just creating that dialogue and that genuinity of 
letting them know to like you can help me too and that will only like intensify the relationship to make it better and more like um inclusive because reverse mentorship doesn't just mean like well the the mentee becomes the mentor it's just more so of it's goes both ways it shouldn't be only one way type of thing and in terms of making those genuine connections in those spaces it's like you have to ask for it if you're a corporation who wants to have a more diverse voice you have to be transparent in the fact that that means the voices at the table aren't diverse enough and so if you take that accountability then people are going to be more willing to help you because it shows that you are looking to fill that gap versus you're looking to just check those boxes I feel like I want to stop talking right now. <laughs> so great, but I'll, I'll allow myself to add something on that because I do think that vulnerability is also linked to by one famous individual, Brené Brown, to courage, uh, and also to cite somebody uh, working the diversity, equity, and inclusion space in Montreal. Um, courage comes doesn't come from bravery necessarily. It comes the the root of the word. Um, it comes from, with heart. So coming with heart to a conversation, a hard conversation, it's willing to, to accept our mistakes, accept the common min misconception that people could have when welcoming or forget, forgetting, as you say. Like when your journey is, is a, has more season under the belt, sometimes we forget the first seasons. So it's really a question of now moving forward and by ending and wrapping up this conversation before opening the floor to questions, I want to invite you to share a specific example because you've all shared a lot um, in our previous conversation. So I'd love to hear and share some of these, uh, these specific examples that you had where you were feeling heard and um, respected and you had accountability and were responsible for, for some of the projects that you participated in. Whoever wants to start. You want to go? Come on, let's yeah, go. I can go first. Um... Yeah, uh, um, like I said, I work in the medical field, and I was in I was an intern last summer, and medical field is very restricted. You have to do very very long test, manual testing, and it can be hard sometimes. And the company is paying these people, and I was pay more to test than actually cutting the feature because features are really simple. The problem is you lose manpower and you lose a lot of money in this uh, in this action because we're our, we're engineers so we're kindly highly paid so what I've done uh, is to said I'm bored doing manual testing maybe we should do um, automatic testing so I've set up pipelines and my mentors knew about pipeline but never had the will to experiment uh, with it so i said okay just take me one week uh, of my work to integrate a full pipeline so i've done it and now when we push code to our cloud and also on machine it runs automatically so uh, they were really excited uh, about this and now they still tell me, you did a really good job because we don't know how this works. And now I've learned that uh, they use my pipeline everywhere in the companies so they can, you know, save money, save time and develop more features because all the testing are during the nights. Love that. For me, an example is when I first opened the consultancy, we were, back then we were, we called ourselves a dev shop. Um, not, not so sophisticated, but somehow we got picked up by a software team. And in that team, there was a single CTO. This person, 25 years of experience, worked in big companies, and he hired four students. And he's like, okay, you guys are self-managed. Let's see if we can work together. And right off the bat, he just put so much trust in us um, that and he also allowed us to perform to our best, give our best ideas, tell him about what type of architecture we want to implement for his system. And he said, "Yeah, uh, throw it all in." Uh, and that's 
basically what we did, we were able to build something really fast for him. Two weeks, uh, minimal viable product completely done, shipped, ready. And we ended up working with them for eight months and kind of that interaction defined who we became later on as a company and was able, it was really something that allowed us to flourish. And I don't think without his mentorship, his praise, and also like just working alongside with us, we wouldn't be where we were, we are today. I love the trust in that relationship. That's, that's really what made the difference. Exactly. Um, I will continue with like two specific ex examples. Um, I mean, like the first one um, at Dawson, like um, my CJEP, I'm just like a lot of other organizations. We have this board of governors and we have like a lot of different committees and they're all making decisions that are impacting students. And but they're often like, you know, non or very like little students sitting on these committees that make decisions. Um, but I was happy that um, for the working group on um, effective communications to students, I was able to actually sit on that committee and have my voice heard. So I was able to bring up a lot of um, issues that um, students were facing. And actually like the admin, they were also like trying to understand like why like, you know, when we post like these documents and why like when we send these documents to students, like they don't seem to get it or, um, you know, a lot of like other issues like that. And I was able to tell them like, hey, like you use like too many platforms, like, you know, whether it's teachers or like just the school admin, we have like Omnibox, Moodle, um, we have like Padlet, Miro and like everything. And like, it's hard for students to keep up. And this is an example of like some issues that like, you know, we're experiencing more, you know, on the grassroots, like at the grassroots level, and then like, you know, the people making decisions, they want to solve that, but they wouldn't be able to know um, if they didn't, you know, write up like students to, to sit on these committees. And another um, more like specific examples of how, um, of like when as a youth, I felt like valued and I felt like it was really like um, a constructive mentorship was during the Technovation Challenge actually. Um, I have the chance to have Ryan in the audience today with me, who is my mentor for um, the Technovation Challenge. Um, and Technovation is like, instead of like, you know, being more like an intern experience, it's more like we have the responsibility to realize this project. And like when we are actually like leaders and we are, when we actually, you know, like put our own hands like on the project to make it like last from beginning to end, like the things, like the skills that we gain is so much like valuable and like like the skills that we gain is so much more than what I would gain as an intern. Because it's more like, you know, you have this project and you have to identify like the problems your, yourself. And like, you know, your mentor is not there to be like, oh, I want to, I think that this function, your app looks good. Like, you know, just learn with me and we'll do it. No, it's more like, um, as a person who is taking care of this project, as a person who is responsible, I learn how to identify problems. I learn how to think of all the functions that I can add in my app. And, you know, I learn how to make this plan so it can actually go help people. Um, so, yeah, I think these were um, very valuable, like, experiences, experiences that I gained through um, some, like, experiences where... Um, youth were actually listened to and at the same time we were able to gain knowledge at the same time of helping the decisions makers solve their problems kind of yeah i'll also answer to that thank you for sharing uh two uh points because uh, it made me think of two two aspects uh, as myself also being an ambassador uh on the business side i'm not a techie unfortunately, but maybe I'll, I'll be, and that's what I wanted to share. As, as a mentor, I feel like more of a mentee. I'm learning more from, from the girls that I accompany building their apps, so I think it's, it's great to, to share that, and, and it's true. Uh, <laughs> I'm learning more than I'm, I'm actually teaching. And um, to your point, when it comes to having um, understanding of student engagement, it's sometimes where there's uh, miscommunication, because as you're saying, there's multiple platform to engage and we misinterpreted, misinterpret sorry, the lack of engagement 
with laziness or with uh, boredom, not wanting to engage really when it really comes to the channel that you're using. So diversifying is great, uh, but testing and proofing is also a good option to go and making sure that the hook is there to, to keep the conversation going. An example, Isaiah, for you. I have one very simple and one a little bit more complex, but as somebody who just was a math tutor, every time or having worked with kids, it's like every time that I have to be a tutor for somebody, they teach me, they're teaching me how to adapt to them. I have to learn how to take like a good tutor doesn't just be like, this is my style. This is, this is what, um, this is like how I teach. It's more so you look at the person that is in the chair and you see, try to get into their head. So now you're learning adaptability. You're learning how to see the lens from them and both effective communication for like, if I can communicate it to you, then I can probably communicate it to your parents and I can explain your parents to your parents the issues that you may be facing and what they have to look out for. So just in, even though I have the knowledge that you're seeking, I'm learning on how to be more adaptable, better communicator and like improving my skills, which in, in a sense goes to like that reverse mentorship. And um, when, from my own perspective, it's like um, back when I was in my final year of my undergrad, a friend and I um, co-founded with two other friends, something called like the Black Student Career Development Day of Ed Tech Concordia. And it started with like, um, we had to, it was funny because we had a connection in alumni office who she had a bad experience working with students because she would say that they're disorganized, they're always late, they don't read instructions. And um, it's hard to refute that when sometimes that may be the case. However, that didn't stop her from allowing us to prove her wrong. We, every step of the way, we went and did what was necessary to reach out to different stakeholders and meet her like defeat those expectations and because she believed in the mission and she wanted to support it it grew and she didn't hesitate to give us that positive feedback of like well you know what like you did it you meet you met it and then she continued to believe in us and now the initiative i think is going to be on volume nine in september type of thing and they're able to host in person events and and bring companies like yourself or student like students like yourself to the events and that type of thing and like you, the same way that as you can learn by teaching somebody or helping and interacting you can teach others on how to accept you and people like you and to be more flexible through your own actions and i think that's kind of like what reverse mentorship is all about thank you for sharing um now we are ready to open the floor to you so, first question, we're ready. Are there any questions? It's okay. Very insightful, thank you. Uh, so my question is, how has uh, remote work, now that we're mostly remote first, affected sort of how the future of work? So how do we get better mentorship? Like back in uh, good old office days, we'd sit people with more experience with new people um, directly in one area to <clears throat> learn all those skills. So what are the challenges you're seeing there? What are some success stories in that? Really good question. So another form of barrier, yeah, being being remote, who wants to go? So I'll kick us off. It's a double-edged sword because now you have more time in the day to go and book a team slot or be like between meetings, like you have a lot more flexibility, but that face-to-face -face engagement can be lacking and like it could affect whether or not you can um, be connecting. But I think there's very, depending on the setting, like is it a large firm, small firm, it's like there's still that in-person aspect. So yes, we can bridge somebody who's in Quebec and Toronto and now you can have more access because you have the remote. But if you both are in Montreal and you want, um, like CGI for example, has a mentorship program 
where they connect you and it's kind of like the job is on, on the mentee to reach out to the mentor so you can reach out and be like hey can we go to the office can we have a coffee chat if it's more so a sanka set be like oh like you didn't go to the office today can we go and grab like an, an evening coffee or something or whatnot so it's really just more flexible and so if you're somebody who needs that personal development like um face to face you can get it but now if you are more social anxiety you could you could be like i'll be at home and we can talk and i'll feel a lot more comfortable because i'm in my space so i think it's just a great addition to the tools you wanted to add something no in my experience, well, actually, I remember choosing software because I thought I could just work from the comfort of my own home. Not a great uh, reason, I know, but um, in my experience, I felt like the best mentorship, the best experiences I had were all in person. I don't think there's ways really to replace that. I think it's possible with hybrid, but uh, generally what I like to push for is in-person meetings and you know you, you just get a lot more you feel more connected to the person right you see them you see their uh, body movements you see how they act the way they talk it's um, I feel it's much more personal in that way and I'd love to see an alternative but right now nothing beats in person for me I do um, have a bit of a different um, a more different insights um, cause like technovation basically like it's like around like five months where we build like an app like from scratch and when I did it, it was like, you know, the year like kind of after COVID. So everything was still online and only the demo day was in person. So like the day of the presentation, but all like all that like journey where like we had workshops online where we had, um, teams meeting online, everything was online, but at the same time, I feel like it kind of like one like remove some barriers of like you know some um of like you know commuting and things like that but at the same time like technovation has also invested in a lot of learning platforms like um i think it's called like ms lms and like now we're using like nectar and there's a lot of like platforms like these that we have used that really helped us um in our journey to achieve like to um to achieve our goals and to May, and to um, put our project in play, into place. But I agree that like in-person celebration is really important because you know at the end at the demo day when we did our in-person pitch, um, this feeling of like you know connecting with your mentor and this feeling of like connecting with like all your other teammates and um, to listen to the other people in person, that was actually very valuable too. So I think definitely like investing in these like um online learning platforms because you know you cannot all go through zoom like there's there's some like better options than um you know just like a zoom call there's like platforms where you can um actually like have like this like discussion thing or like you can have like this vision board thing um so yeah just some suggestions like that i do have to agree sorry P pardon my enthusiasm of grabbing the mic back to to, to myself um it's just I want to touch upon one thing based on that platform that you shared with Technovation. It is a platform that is similar to Discord, Slack. It was built by student, for student, with student, and for everybody, I guess. So it was. It, it's great to see tools like that that bring forth uh, innovation. And to your point, even if the company is fully remote, because re remoteness did not was not created with COVID, other companies were. Um, I do believe understanding the principle of flexibility and it's, it requires the adoption of new types of behaviors. It is difficult to take the time to book that meeting because we want to take a longer break because we feel like we have the flexibility, but it is worth it to have that catch up. Um, and it's the only way, as you're saying, Simon, it's the only way to quote unquote fake it till we make it to reproduce the informal setting of an in-person um, conversation, but food for thought, absolutely. Any other question? Yes. Um, I was wondering how you would concretely measure the impacts of this growth mindset beyond just the result. Like if you notice changes in like organization or employee satisfaction. 
I'll go first. Sometimes, similar to like a math equation, looking for those variables X and Y, it's like you got to work backwards. So if you want to measure impact, like, yes, you have your ESG reports that companies go and do like, this is how many women we're hiring. This is how many debt people, POCs. This is what we're doing in STEM. Like those are like the clear cut variables. But if you want to, sometimes you have to work backwards and look like, what are you missing? Like, this is what you have. This is what you're doing but what don't you have? Or is your, like when you look at the top leadership brass, what do they look like? Do you see, like a quote from before that stuck with me is like, if you see it, you be it. If you have all this diversity at lower levels, but then when you look up, it's not diverse, like that's problematic. Um, if you see like your numbers of resignations and you notice a, a trend line there, you might wanna be like, post employment interviews or interviewing people in the department like you have to get a little creative if you want to be ahead of the curve in that and rather just be like checkbox so like it really a lot there's a for diversity a lot of people proactively kind of like do the easy wins where they're like we'll do this workshop we'll do that workshop we'll do this mandatory training but diversity and inclusion is kind of like going a step beyond that and being like okay how do we make sure that people can rise to the top how do we make sure people are genuinely creating like that like we love to be here atmosphere and that takes some creativity and that's why like it's important to have um youth there the way i see it beyond you know measurables and metrics that you can look at just a feeling, just a feeling to go into work. Are you feeling energized? Are you looking forward to, to seeing the people you're working with? And if not, like, why don't you feel that way? Is it because you're not feeling heard? Is it because you don't have, feel like you have impact? And I think these can all be solved through through the conversations we talked about earlier, through, through mentorship. And yeah, I think it's generally the feeling, it's the energy that you look forward to working every day and going in there. That, Go? Yeah, I would just wanted to add like also maybe like assessing the the progress of your employees instead of like only looking at the results, you know, growth mindset, but also like looking at how um like the as like the skills that like you know this person gain from like this failure or like how the skills that like this person um like you know gain through this project, even though it wasn't as successful like how these learned skills can also be used to be put into a bigger project later and how these experiences are as valuable to prevent other future uh, failures in the future uh, and it reminds me of what was shared by Val Yanetti earlier uh, when you feel that it's a question of feeling also but a really simple assessment if people and it doesn't have to be youth they stop asking questions then they lose their curiosity. Uh, by having that removed, then you might have less engagement. Um, and it's, it's fairly simple to understand. So that way, it's, you don't even have to wait for that report. You kind of can know as you are doing it. And uh, I do believe we might have, no, we will, unless there's a question, a last question. Yes, please do. Um, so my question is just how would you say that we could balance like the growth mindset of a younger generation with the traditional practices that an older generation like brings to the workplace? I'll kick us off. Okay, so it's, it's a duality where think about the relationship you have with your parents, assuming hopefully you have or um, a parental figure in your life, right? Where good parents typically allow you to learn and grow, but also make sure that you do that risk assessment so that they'll know, like they'll let you go. You'll be like, I wanna, I'm working a good job. I wanna move out. They don't be like, no, you're not moving out. You're not like something, like they care about your safety and your concerns, but they don't stop you from pursuing what you want as long as it's on the right path type of thing. So that balance in an organization looks like, well, okay, I want us to go and 
have aggressive targets per se in the diversity and inclusion, but also taking into account those realistic constraints of that money is an object that like space, like if, if you said tomorrow, I'll be like, okay, I want to move my $20 million headquarters to like, I don't know, like um, Ottawa, but your business is all in Montreal and you, it wouldn't really make sense type of thing. So it's really just, having that aggressive creative strategy and like being creative in what you want to achieve and what you want to get, but also taking out the time to map out like this, the situation and like doing that research because Rome wasn't built in a day, but like you can go and build for tomorrow. So just like balance those two things. Um, I think like um, for me, like I, I thought of like the learning like at school because like we were, I think we're too often like, you know, told to listen, to respect the rules. This is what we were taught. Like it was like taught to us like this, like, you know, back in the days for the other generation. And it's still pretty much the case um, right now. Um, so I think like to balance like the growth mindset that can benefit like the older generation, but also the new generation is find some like common gaps. Um, cause, because like, I think like, you know, we, we all went through like the school system where we're more um, taught to listen more, le more taught to like respect the rules than to innovate. And I think like, you know, to benefit like both the older generations and the new generation and the newer generation, what we can do is that we find these common gaps where we can actually, you know, together find some solutions to innovate and commonly try to um, kind of like adopt the same approaches that will benefit um, all of us. Yeah. I think the idea of this balance, it's not limited to organizational. It's very much um, internal as well. I think even as you become older and you have occupy a senior position, it definitely helps to still have that growth mindset and to adopt that balance innately between you know uh, the younger generation but the older and also the older generation but within the same person and i think we can all learn from that and that's that's the idea behind mentorship right is taking from the old taking from the new and going through your own journey and to close do you want to go just one last word Clément? yes uh it's like a couple goal uh, by this i mean we have to know the limit of the older person and the younger person. Uh, we can't push uh, things to older people and people can't push things toward us. So I think knowing the limit of each other could be a big step. And like a couple, sometimes you have to do compromises. So I do one step, you do one step, and one day we will uh, find a, a solution. But like I, like I say in every company, we're human and changes is very slow when it's about processes that involve humans. So to bring to a close our conversation, um, we talked about journey, we talked about the path, that learning path that we are in on, leveraging all the generations, because we say always two, we always compare two generations, so I think it's, it's great to think about all the generation, because there's also the next one after yours. Uh, there's more than just one above or pre before, uh, and leveraging all the tools that people can bring to clean up that path and make the learning journey more accessible and inclusive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Madison. You. Thank you, people. Yes. <laughs>